Okay, welcome everybody to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Glad you could join us here. Uh, every Wednesday night around 6.45, this is where we're at. So uh, join us on the uh, live stream service, or you can uh, watch it later on if need be. But anyway, glad you're here tonight. We're going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about Sunday morning. Sunday morning, 9 a.m., we have RCC Bible Study TV, which is on our YouTube channel. It's at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. We have a new episode. And then uh, we take a short break, and 10 o'clock you can join us on our Facebook page, and our Facebook, uh, uh, I guess that's what you call it, page mm -hmm. on the uh, internet, yeah. and uh, for our live stream service here at the church. Uh, I'd like to remind you about our book. Our book is a prayer book. It's not a prayer request book, but a book with names in it from all over the world. We'll be happy to put your name in there or someone you want us to pray for. And if you'll send a name and a good address, I'll send you one of our decals. It says... Rockin' Country Church is praying for me. So we'll be happy to send that out to you so that when you see it, you know that there's a church here in Kemp, Texas that's lifting you up to the Lord on a regular basis. Glad you could join us tonight. We are in the book of Acts, the great book of Acts, chapter 9. We're going to be in chapter 9. We're going to start talking about uh, uh, Saul's encounter with Christ where he becomes Paul on the road to Damascus, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard the story, and we're going to go through that tonight, okay? So again, God bless you, glad you're here with us tonight, we're going to do our prayer requests and praise reports, so we're going to go around the table, take care of that, if you have one, Terry's monitoring, just type it into your phone, and we'll be more than happy to share it with everybody, so that uh, we can get you on our prayer list tonight, okay? Mm -hmm. So with that, let's go ahead, and Sister Carolyn, can we start with you? Sure. Okay, uh, me and William, mm -hmm. my family and church family, mm -hmm. the lost and the fallen away, uh, the Middle East, our military, Toby Keith's family. Yep. You know, yep. he passed Lost away. Toby Keith. Yeah. Uh, Chris and Lori, uh, Michelle Baker's mom, and I think her name is Diane, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't remember what it is, but she's doing pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But she's Better. had some heart issues. Yeah, a lot of issues. Yeah. Uh, Crystal and uh, Linda, uh, your upcoming surgeries. Right, right. And travel mercies for Cherry. Thank amen. you. You're welcome. And Jack's prayer. Amen, amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Margo. Uh, you and Terry. Thank you. surgery. My church, my family, Rosie, my sister, and my, my brother, Myra, Beverly and Ted, Carolyn and William, thank you, Colleen, Trail Life, American Heritage Girl, Jack's Prayer, Chris and Lori, and did I say Woody's surgery? Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. And Terry's dad. Amen. Thank you. Good deal. Thank you, sister. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother, you, oh, Tommy's down there. I didn't, sorry, I didn't see you behind Terry yeah, here. I was hiding from you. Too. Yeah, okay, <laughs> <laughs> brother Tommy. It, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you. All right, brother, you usual. I you usual, so it's me. Okay, thanks, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ain't going to waste the time to call on him anymore. I'm just going to write it down. We're going to have a good Bible study because it's going to be... <laughs> yeah, we, we, may, we may finish the book of Acts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, Sister Edie. Uh, Thomas and I, my sister is Sue and Dan, my son his life, uh, Kathy Duvino, because she's having her eyes done. That's right. <clears throat> um, Holly and Gary and their family, uh, Terry for travel, travel, yeah. and take care of her dad. Thank you. Uh, Winnie for your, uh, your, I didn't put surgery, I put surgeries. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, they're a little, they're a ways off, but yeah, we'll yeah. take it for the I'll be back by the time he has Our church. And the ministries of our church, everyone that should be here, mm -hmm. and everybody that's not. Right, yeah. amen. amen. And we just ask that the Lord takes care of all of us. There you go, there you go. You bet. And sometimes, you know, you, you get to where you don't have, uh, you know, you can't have people because they got things going on in their lives. So, yeah. you know, we definitely want to lift them up as well, those who are usually here. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're the faithful crowd, if you will. Yeah. All right, sister wife. <clears throat> uh, Brett and Becky, because they're not here. So. Yeah, I don't know what's going like, on. They're on the list of what Edie said, the, the ones that are usually here. Right. And um, 
Online we have uh, Chris Roby, says Pastor Woody and Terry, church leadership, congregation, their family, everyone there, continue healing for Lori and him, and two unspokens. Amen. And Lori King says her usual, because you know that includes her animals. Yeah. And Kenneth Parr says his usual tonight, so we'll pray for Kenneth to get well. Tonight? Hope, hopefully he's getting over what he was. Whatever it is. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, church, for, for me, myself, pray for the church, everyone here, my family, and thank you for the prayers for my dad. Um, my sister, Susan, and her family, they're going through some challenges. Um, Kathy Trevino's eye uh, cataract surgery, William and his health, and Carolyn and her health, and, and um, everyone in this room. Um, let's see, did I say anything? Three Unspokens, Middle East, and the USA. Okay. And you. You got a pretty good list there. Yeah. I'm going to ditto your list. <laughs> and add your name. All right. All right. Deborah, how about you? You got anything you want to pray for tonight? Oh, I'm the last one. You're the last one. Uh, yes. Yeah, we've already had Bible study. We're just oh, going yeah. over it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> she's on she got the same watch for Rich she got. <laughs> no, I uh, uh, just I want to praise God that we can be here Amen. and uh, uh, worship and uh, and uh, accosted. If that's the right word. But um, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, MediShare is a uh, uh, I'm part of the Medishare program, and it's not insurance, but uh, it's a, a sharing program where Christians share each other's bills if they get approved. Right. <laughs> and so I talked with them today, and uh, I call, called them uh, with every intention of quitting because I paid in a whole year, and I, I didn't really have, didn't have a need for it and because they don't uh, pay for dental. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, after talking with uh, uh, the um, administrators, well, the person that answered the phone, mm -hmm. uh, um, she uh, she told me they they don't f pay for crowns and fillings and cleanings and X-rays mm -hmm. and all that, but they will pay share uh, for root canals. And I've got two root canals that I need to have done there you go. real real quick. So uh, I want to follow up with some more questions, uh, but I, I really feel like that God was answering a prayer of mine. There you go. So I'm praising for that. You bet. Amen. Sounds good. You bet. All right. Uh, I guess it leaves me, doesn't it? Yep. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I stand in agreement with all y'all. Terry's got a really good li list that I agree with, uh, especially when I lift up. Those folks over in uh, uh, the Middle East over there, around uh, Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Israel and Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Persia, all those areas over there, So, especially our soldiers and such. Um, the travel mercies for Terry. She is going. She's going to be gone a while, and I hope she has a good time. How am I getting to the airport tomorrow? I don't know. Okay. I don't know who's taking you. <laughs> I guess you better get up early and start walking. Yeah. If you start tonight to after Bible study, you might be able to make it. Can't okay? keep thumb. <laughs> anyway, I think I'll get you there like always. <laughs> yeah, well, let's have travel mercies for, for us. If we're going in the morning because mm -hmm. we have uh, we got delayed one time just in uh, we on 45 there we uh, we went about a half a mile in in. Uh, 45 minutes, so mm -hmm. uh, wrecks can happen now. <laughs> Pray with us. Yeah. Oh man, it's terrible. And it was a terrible wreck. It was like six vehicles involved in it. Yeah. It was a very bad wreck. Uh, but anyway, I just pray God will just give us a clear path in the morning. And He usually does. Yep. And uh, does. Get, get there safely. And mm -hmm. anyway, um, all those who, can, who are not here tonight, who usually are, we'll especially lift them up in a little extra prayer, if you will. Uh, Many are here, many are sick that are not here, and <clears throat> other things going on, so we just lift them up. Uh, I especially want to lift up, and God knows who they are, 
two particular families in our church that are going through uh, their adult children are going through some tough things and I want to especially lift those up. God knows who those people are. Mm -hmm. And then my uh, niece Sherry, she's still battling breast cancer and all that over in, uh, in Georgia, northern Georgia. I want to continue lifting her up. My sister, her mom taking help take care of her and then also her sister Amanda who is helping take care of her. Mm -hmm. um, and then she's got issues with her family just like everybody else does. So right. anyway, she has a lot of stress going on and she just doesn't need it right now. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I guess it's about it. Kathy Trevino says she's doing well. Good, good, good. And, and then Becky said, well, she didn't really ask for prayer. I think she texted it to me, but I can't see my text. So okay. we'll just put their usual on. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, well, we're glad that Kathy's doing good. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Did, did anybody pray for our upcoming primary elections on March the 5th? Not as yet. Uh, but yeah, we definitely want to play, pray for the elections, mm -hmm. and not just, not just the primaries, but also the, the main ones in November. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Get out and vote. That's yeah. God direct you to vote. All right. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and prep for teaching. We'll get started. Unless anybody got anything else. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for. Uh, your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can get into your word and understand your word and and um, and you just reveal it to us. And that's what we need, Lord. We need your guidance and direction in all things. We need your wisdom to, to share with us so that we can come to a better understanding of, of what your word is for us and, and, and to us and what you want us to learn uh, so that we can direct our lives in the paths that you want us to, to follow. Father, we are going to see tonight how uh, you took one individual person and changed their life just 180 degrees. I mean, just completely and uh, in just a couple of days. And, and uh, I pray that you will do the same thing with us. Just continue changing us as we walk the path you've called us to walk. As you lead us, let us follow, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, so we're in chapter 9. And we're going to talk about Saul, and uh, uh, I think it'll probably go pretty quick since we don't have a whole lot of people tonight, um, but we'll just see how it goes. I mean, we can go all the way through uh, chapter 1, is it 26 chapters, I think it is tonight, so we can go all the way there if we need to. Everybody else in the staff Yeah, I can look me up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, so starting with uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Now keep going. And asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound. To Jerusalem. Alright, now we talked about this a little bit last week about how Saul, who is going to become Paul, but right now he's Saul, and he what he is doing is he is he is on a mission of God to uh, quote a movie. Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, but somewhere it says I'm on a mission of God. I think it's the uh, uh, the Jim Belushi. Jim, yeah, Jim Belushi and, and the other guy who are doing the John Belushi. The, the, what are the brothers? Blues Brothers. Blues Brothers, yeah. yeah. Doing the Blues Brothers, they're on a mission from God. Yeah. And so, <laughs> uh, y'all don't remember that movie, don't you? <laughs> That's okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Saul is totally convinced, 100%, that he is on a mission from God. And he is trying to do God's work. He is protecting God, he thinks. Kind of like what Peter says, you know. Uh, Whenever he was talking with Jesus, he says, don't worry about it. You know, you got me here, man. Ain't nothing going to happen to you, sure. you know? Uh -huh. Well, of course, we know that Jesus told uh, Peter to get thee behind Satan because you don't know the things of God. You only know the things of man. Well, this is exactly what Paul did, or Saul. He's doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. He is thinking that he is, he is doing what pleases God, but he's not understanding that God sent Christ here to start the church, which was called the way. So if you look up here in verse 2, you will see where it says, <clears throat> those who were of the way, capital W, all right? Mm -hmm. And so that is what 
That is what Christianity was called. It was called the way, following Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Remember that? Mm -hmm. John 14, 6. And so this is where it comes from. It comes from Jesus saying, I am the way. And so we follow Jesus, so it is called the way. It's not called the Protestants. It's not called the Catholic. It's not called the Baptists. It's not called the Episcopalians. It's not, it's not called any of the denominations. So we know that in this little verse right here, we know that there's only two denominations according to the Bible. There's either Jew or Gentile or Jew or Christian, and that's it as far as believers. Uh, and that's it. There's no other denominations. All other denominations man came up with and actually didn't come up with it until the 3rd the, uh, century. Uh, and so this, this group of Christians that have been meeting together since the day of Pentecost in different houses and such ha are, have grown and grown and grown and now there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands thousands of them, you know. And Paul is thinking, Saul is thinking, man, it's just getting out of hand. I got to do something about it. And of course, we know he's a mighty man of God as far as the Jewish religion is concerned. And so he's got to put a stop to it. And so he feels as though in his heart of hearts, he is doing God an honor or a justice or he's doing the work of God by stopping the Christians, by getting rid of them and, and putting an end to this thing called the way. And uh, we're going to see in just a second where he has his first encounter with Christ. All right, so are we okay with all that? Yep. All right, now we understand where it says back over here, was breathing threats, was murderous against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and got orders. So basically what he did, uh, he got an arrest warrant, if you will, from the high priest to go and arrest anybody who was a part of Christianity. Anybody who was a part of Christianity. He had the, the orders by the high priest, the Jewish priest now, to go and arrest him. All right, and have him thrown into prison. All right, men, women, babies, it didn't matter. He was after them all. All right, verse uh, 3. Actually, 3 and 4. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around, around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, now, we're going to understand that Saul becomes Paul. And... We can read over in Galatians 1 to where, uh, don't go there, but where Paul talks about the things that he learned, he, did, he learned directly from Christ. He says, I was not taught by man, I wasn't taught by anything other than God and, and Jesus Christ, the things that I taught. We can see over in uh, 1, and I think it's around verse 14, where he says, uh, for uh, I think it's two years he spent with Christ, learning from Christ. So Christ was speaking to him for the first, during his teaching and, and bringing him uh, to the knowledge and the wisdom of Christianity. But the first encounter that, that Paul has is the resurrected Jesus, or you could say God from heaven, because Jesus was in heaven at this time. He ascended, remember? He is speaking directly to Saul. So it is the voice of God Speaking, you know, sometimes we play around and we say, Carolyn, you know, this is God. I want you to do this. Or, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Well, what would you, well, how would you feel if you literally heard the word of, I mean, the voice of God in an audible voice speak to you? Now, we hear the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. But if, what if you heard, Woody, you better not do that again. I'm going to slap you, boy, or something, you know. <laughs> I mean, what if you literally heard the voice of God? Would you not be terrorized? Oh, yeah. I mean, I... Pass out. Oh, yeah. Driving down the road in a ditch. Yeah, he would probably just go and follow up with a heart attack or something. Exactly. All right, but... He start drinking. No, he wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be him. It'd probably make you stop. <laughs> but, uh, but seriously, he spoke to him in an audible voice. And he's saying, you know, why are you, now we use the word, in mm -hmm. scripture uses the word persecuting me, but he's not actually persecuting Christ because Christ is speaking from heaven. Right. But if he's persecuting the church, 
then he's persecuting Christ, right? Remember what Jesus said over in the book of John, the Gospel of John, he says, they first hated me, so if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you, right? If they persecute you, they're persecuting me. No, no, no. And so this is exactly what he's saying. He's going back to what he had already told his apostles, uh, you know, Peter and John and James and all them. He had already told them is that expect this stuff to happen. Expect people to persecute you. And, uh, and if they're persecuting you, then they're persecuting him, Jesus. And so this is exactly what has happened. He's, he prophesied that, and here it is coming to, true, to truth uh, by uh, uh, Saul doing just that. But he speaks to Paul to Saul and says, why are you persecuting me? Now, of course, Saul is hearing this voice from heaven. So he's saying, uh, whoever me is, me ain't around here. because It's just me and my guys, you know. But then Paul says, if you'll read verse 5. And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. All right, now, I love that part where he says, Who are you, Lord? Uh, so you got to be Lord because, hey, none of these guys around here, Lord. You know, these are my guys, and they're, they're my servants, my soldiers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, a voice from heaven, that's got to be God himself speaking. And, of course, it was. And then Jesus, of course, pronounces himself, and he says, I am Jesus. This is who you're persecuting. And, uh, of course, you would think that Paul is saying, well, I'm not persecuting you, Jesus. I'm persecuting these, these Christians that are, you know, following the way. So why are you after me? You know, I didn't do anything to you. But we know that because of what Jesus had prophesied earlier is that if you persecute a Christian, you're persecuting Christ. Because he says, just like even today, if, and he tells us, he says, you know, uh, you're going to have people to come against you in his name or for his name. And in doing so, we will be blessed. So when people come against us, and, and I try to think of this instead of my old ways, whenever people come against me, I want to just, you know, <laughs> you know, not take care of them. But instead of doing that, I have to realize what Christ says because he tells us the same thing. If they persecuted him, they'll persecute us. Mm -hmm. And they will. Yeah. So, and he says, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have people that disagree with you. You're going to have people that slander you. You're going to have people that, that don't believe you. You're going to have people that call you names. No, 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 no. So when people do that, uh, because Christ says, whenever they persecute you, you will receive blessings by God. You know, Blessings will be poured out on you. So when somebody, I'm going to put it this way, says, when someone curses me, I think, thank you. That means I'm going to get a blessing somehow, you know, because God's going to take care of that. He's going to cover that. That's a good way to think of it. I have to think of it that way because the other way is the way I want to think of it. <laughs> and the other way is not the way to think of it. Right. That's not what we should do because we have to remember whenever they slandered Christ, remember as he was on his way to Golgotha, that he said, the scripture says he spoke not a word. Remember we read over in Isaiah 53 last week where it says that not a word came out of his mouth, you know. And, and that's what we have to do. We have to bite our tongue and just say, oh, God's going to bless me somehow, some way because of the persecution you just did. What's so. wrong with my tongue? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's what, I, that's what I try to do. I just try to remember it that way and then... Uh, most of the time, I can just get over whatever it is, you know. Right. And sometimes I have to walk away. I have to turn the other cheek, as he says. You know? <laughs> if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, offer them the other. Not that they can hit it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay? But, but that's what I do. I just, I just think, okay, God, but, you know, this ain't right, and I shouldn't do something about it, but I'm not going to because <laughs> you're going to take care of it. Right. And so I look forward to the blessing. Okay? And believe me. It, it comes. It does. Yeah. It does. When, per, when people persecute you for the Lord, you know, for being who you are, etc., 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 you're going to get blessed somehow, some way. Okay, you are. If that's how you, if that's how you <laughs> trust, if that's how you trust. Okay, see, that's the problem. Yeah. We want to react one way, 
where we need to act, react like Christ acts. And this is what Christ is trying to get him to, uh, him to understand. He's going to try to get him to understand. He says, look, I am Jesus. And you are persecuting my church, which in turn is persecuting me. All right? And then Jesus is going to take and turn it all around. All right? Are we good with that? No, oh, let me let me explain the goads. Oh, well, uh, was to ask. What does yeah. That mean? Okay. The first time that I saw this years and years ago, I thought it was the gourds, you know, like the gourds that grow in the ground, you know. But it's not. It's goads. So what a goad is? A goad is actually it started out as an eight-foot stick, if you will, just in, like a shaft or whatever, mm -hmm. an eight-foot stick. And people used it to direct their goats, you know, like the, the staff of the, of the shepherd, to direct their goats and direct their oxen and all that kind of stuff. Well, when they started using actual plows and things like that, that stick would not knock the mud and all that off of the, uh, the blades of the plows or off the hooves of the animals or whatever. And so it was sharpened. Well, sticks break, sticks rot, etc., etc. So they started making them out of steel or out of maybe iron, or whatever it was. And so it basically was a st uh, roughly an eight foot steel shaft, you know, a thin shaft. And it was sharpened on one end so that they could scrape the mud off of the animal's hooves, off of their feet. And, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, something to use, a tool used. All right. But it was uh, also used to help pry stuff. And uh, it, it was a, a tool that they used on a constant basis. And what it is a reference to here is it was a tool of correction. Okay? I mean, that's how they bring it down. They bring it down to a tool of correction. If something is wrong, you can use the goad to straighten it out. So what, when Jesus says, why are you kicking at the goads? He is saying, why are you kicking at my direction or my counseling to you when you know it's right? Why are you trying, why are you refusing it? Why are you trying to go against it instead of <laughs> taking it like you should and understanding it? So it's, here it is referred to as an instrument of correction or an instrument of counseling by Jesus, which of course that's what the Bible is. And the Bible is an instrument of correction and an inst uh, instrument of guidance for us, okay? And if we don't follow it, the Bible and what it teaches us and how it teaches us, then we're kicking against the goats, okay? Because we're kicking against the, the counsel of God. And that would not be a smart thing to do. Okay? So, that's what a, a goad is. It's actually a tool used to correct something that needs correcting. Okay? And uh, we certainly could use lots of correction in our lives. So, that's why we study the Bible, right? Right. Okay. Uh, verse 6. So, he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Okay, arise and go into the city, and you will be told. And is he going to be told by God? Is God going to send him a text? Is he going to call him on the phone? I mean, how is he going to get this, you know? He doesn't have any idea. But see, this is a this is a unknown direction given by Christ to do something and to be obedient not knowing what to do. You follow what I'm trying to get at? Okay, it's the same way whenever God called to Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Okay? He says, go where I tell you to go. So Abraham, in my opinion, if I were Abraham, I said, okay, fine. Now, so give me a road map, and I'm going to go here, so we're going to stop here tonight. Then we're going to go here, and we're going to go there. And, you know, the, show me where I'm going. You know, I'm not just going to take off. I mean, do I need to take 10 camels, 20 camels, one camel? What do I need for the trip? Abraham, he told Abraham, he said, go where I tell you to go. And Abraham did. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing that Paul's going through here. He's not given a direct or all the information that he needs or would, we would normally want, but he's being obedient to do what God tells him to, go, to do, what Jesus is telling him to do. He says, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And of course we know that uh, he's going to become the over the next, how many years was it? I can't even think how many years he lasted. 
it wasn't very many years, but anyway, um, probably like 30, maybe 40 years that, that Paul lasted before he was killed. And uh, he got a lot accomplished in 30, 40 years. I'm going to say 30, 40. I don't know how many it was. Um, but he said, uh, he said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who are you persecuting? So he trembled and was astonished, and the Lord and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So right there, he surrendered to the Lord. He surrendered to his authority. And he says, okay, what do you want me to do? And that's what I'm going to do. And Jesus says, this is what I want you to start out with. Not giving him all the information that we would want, just saying, I want you to go to the city, and you'll find out. Is that what happened to you when you started this church? Yep. <laughs> and whenever we yeah. broke up, you know, after three years or whatever, I started breaking up because I thought I was, I thought, man, I guess I was wrong. I don't know what's going on, you know, because I didn't really know what to do. Yeah. And, of course, we've been through some, you know, time since then to where, um, you know, things come up and you're not sure what to do. And you just have to pray about it and let the Lord take care of it. Right. And He has. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, when he first said, I want you to start a church, I was like, well... Really? <laughs> how do you do that? I don't have a clue how to do it. Because, you know, I don't have any education or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, it's just like, and that's whenever he says, you just do what I tell you to do and right. you'll be alright. Like whenever we split up, I went to him and I says, you know, I don't know, I don't, I can't sing. I can't uh, do nursery. I can't do the secretary stuff. You know, what am I supposed to do? I, was I wrong? He goes, didn't I tell you just follow me? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. He said, well, then follow me. I said, okay, let's go. Yeah. And we're still going. So there you are. Okay. And that's what we have to do. Whenever we hear from the Lord, whether it's we think it's an audible voice or whether it's an internal voice, we have to be obedient to the Word, obedient to the voice that speaks to us. Right. Now, the first thing you have to do is make sure that it's coming from God. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that's the first thing. Well, okay, so how do you do that? If it glorifies God, if it lines up with His Word, and lines up with His will, it's from God. If it doesn't do all three things, it's most likely not from God. Okay? It's got to do all three things. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see you. I've been telling him to drag you in here. So I just did. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I told him, I said, if she don't come back, you can't be here anymore. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm just going to leave. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> but but that's what we have to do whenever the Lord speaks to us. We have to realize, because Satan is a, is a deceiver. He will do anything and everything in semblance of the Lord so that we think it's from the Lord. Okay? So we have to try to distinguish, is this from God or is this from Satan? If it sounds good to us, it's probably going to be from Satan, all right? But because, you know, Satan is going to tempt us with things with pleasure and things that we see, things that we, we see other people doing, and he's going to tempt us with those things. Oh, everybody does it. It's okay. Go ahead. But if God does it, then it's for his glory and not ours. So if it's only for our glory, then it's probably from Satan, okay? But if it lines up with his word, if it lines up with his will, and if it glorifies Him, then you are guaranteed that it is from God. Okay? But it has to meet all three criteria. If one of them is gone, it's probably not from God. Okay? Because God is not going to call you to do anything that is not going to line up with His Word, is not going to line up with His will, and is not going to glorify Him. So those three things have to, have to be there. And if those three things are there, then yes, it will it will be from God. You're guaranteed it will be. Alright? So that's uh, so we should never sweat it if those three criteria are met. Alright? But if one's missing, don't jump. Okay? Because all three will always be there. Alright, uh, seven, right? Yes. Okay. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Yeah, and some in some translations it says that they fell down, they passed out, uh, they were they were also blinded, they didn't see anybody. And in, in this translation, 
the New King James, it says that they did not see anybody, but they heard. Okay? And that would be like, um, I don't know, uh, walking down a dark alley and hear something going, it, no, it's there somewhere, right? <laughs> so this is kind of the way that they did, you know. They didn't know exactly what it was, but they heard something that scared them pretty bad. And so they pretty much kind of just froze in their tracks and waited for, uh, waited for it to either pass or complete or whatever. But, uh, but they did not, but Paul, or Saul, Saul at this point, Saul actually saw Christ. Okay. Now he's not going to see anything here in a minute. But at this point, he actually saw Christ. He was appointed by Christ. This is one of the criteria of being an apostle. You have to be, and this is what I was telling you about in Galatians 1, uh, you have to be appointed by Christ directly. Uh, we have a lot of people today who call themselves apostles and all, and, you know, whatever, that's all fine and good. But, and of course they'll say, oh yeah, in a vision, I was appointed by Christ. Right. Well, uh, there's many other smarter people than me that disagree with that, and I disagree with it. Why? Because after Christ, there does not need to be another apostle. He is our apostle. He is Here, if you read through the scriptures, these people relied on the apostles, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to see Peter coming into the action here in just a little bit. We're going to see a, a lady, uh, Tabitha, healed, uh, brought back from the dead by the apostles. We've already seen where uh, Peter's shadow would touch somebody and heal them. Okay, it doesn't say Jesus did all that, right? It said the apostles did it, mm -hmm. right? So until Paul being the last of the, of the true apostles, then that leaves only Christ. So instead of us relying on people now to be that apostle, we rely on Christ to be that apostle, all right? Because he is the only apostle that we need, and certainly there's none more reliable or trustworthy here trustworthier or more trustworthy than uh, Christ right. and so we rely on him because we don't want to rely on another man right we don't follow another man no. so there is I'm just going to say some may disagree and that's okay but in my opinion and others a lot smarter than me other than Christ there are no apostles you can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself but as far as a true apostle you have to be, actually, if you read, we've said, we write, saw this over in Acts 2, remember? Uh, in order to be an apostle, you have to be appointed by Christ, by Him specifically. You have to have walked with Christ, okay? Paul walked with Christ. I told you about it over in Galatians 1, where he says, what was taught to me was taught by no man, but taught by God Himself. And then over in 1 and 14 in Galatians, you see where Paul says, and I spent two years learning directly from Christ, okay? Uh, and so all the other apostles that are in the scriptures walked with Christ, right. okay? And then it also says that they had to be a witness to his crucifixion and resurrection, all right? There ain't nobody alive today that was alive back then, right. okay? So as far as scriptures concerned, there's three criteria of being an apostle, and nobody today meets that, meets that criteria, no one, okay? They just, you can't, <laughs> unless you're 2,000 some odd years old <laughs> and still walking. Yep. Yep. All right? Okay. Um, I don't, eight? Uh -huh. Okay. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Go ahead and read that as well. And he was... He was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So it's kind of like uh, Jesus in the wilderness. He went 40 days without eating and drinking. Um, this is kind of, uh, it's a fasting type, but it's really not, uh, fasting is done by the human desire, okay? I want to fast so that I can get closer to God. This is something that God has directed Paul to do so that Paul can, not have any any interruptions, any uh, anything uh, to take his mind off of anything else other than trying to envision what Christ is wanting to do with him. Uh, we're going to find out in a little bit. He had scales over his eyes, something like scales over his eyes. So his eyes were blinded to the point to where he there's no way that he could see. It wasn't as though it was a dimly lit area or anything like that. 
there was to be no distractions to him whatsoever so that he could be fully, fully concentrate on trying to hear from God, if you will, all right, and submitting himself to God. You ever get into a, to a, uh, a spot in your life to where the, all the troubles of the world seem like they're coming in on you, and you've got to get yourself to a point to where you just forget about anything, and then, I don't know, maybe hear a song, maybe do a prayer, maybe do read a book or something, but you got to get everything off your plate except just that one thing in order just to have peace, mm -hmm. right? I know I've been there several times. Well, this is what he needed to do. He needed to get everything off his plate. He needed to get his persecution of the Christians out of the way. He needed to get uh, all the theology that he's learned from Gamaliel and all them. Uh, he needs to get everything off his plate except where he's at right now. And uh, I love the uh, uh, prodigal son over in uh, Luke 15 where it, we talked about this in the man's discipleship the Monday night uh, where it says, and he came to himself. Okay, mm -hmm. this guy was out. You know, you know the story. He squandered all his riches. He was in the pigsty eating the, the cobs of the pigs, what the pigs were eating. And he came to himself, and he says, "The slaves have it better than I do. My parents, my dad's slaves, have it better. Mm -hmm. So I gotta, I gotta realize where I'm at and start changing things." And this is where Paul is. Paul is at a point where he has to come to himself, if you will, and realize, I mean, I gotta change. I gotta change right now today. Because he just spoke to Christ. And Christ, Christ spoke back to him. Mm. Blessings. Thank you. <clears throat> so for three days he was out without sight and, and neither ate nor drank in order to concentrate or in order to not have any distractions whatsoever and just meditate, if you will, on Christ, okay? All right, this is Ananias, okay? This is a guy that uh, God is calling to uh, to go to Paul, or to, to Saul. He's not Paul yet, okay, to go to Paul. Saul, keep saying that. All right, verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. All right. Now, if you see this, he says it's, uh, he's in a disciple of Damascus. Paul was on the road to Damascus. So Ananias most likely had heard, Saul is coming to imprison me. Saul is coming to, uh, you know, roust us all up. He's got these petitions of arrest and all this stuff. So, you know, Ananias is sitting there going, ah, I know who this guy is. And of course he did by all the things that Paul and Saul had already done. Mm -hmm. And so when the Lord talks to him, he's going like, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I know this guy. I know what he's coming here to do. Right. All right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. But he says to the Lord, he says, here I am. Because he, he, again, the Lord spoke to him as well. All right? In a verbal voice, in an audible voice. Uh, verse 11. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Taurus, for behold, he is praying. All right. He had already sent Saul of Tarsus. Okay, by the way, that's Tarsus. Tarsus. Yeah. Okay. He had already sent, that's where Paul's from, that's where he was born, the, the, mm -hmm. the area that he's from. Okay. Um, but the, he had already sent Saul to Damascus to go to this particular house called Straight. He says, go to the city, into the city, back up here in verse 6, and uh, you will be told the thing, what things you must do. So Saul is already there at this particular house. Now, he tells Ananias, he says, arise and go to a street called Straight. So Ananias is also already in Damascus, okay? But this place called Straight, or the street called Straight, is actually a street that still exists today and it runs through the, the, the uh, city of Damascus east to west and it is just one straight street running from east to west all the way across the city. It'd be kind of like um, uh, on Old Kemp Highway up here in Kemp. 
-hmm. It goes all the way through Kemp, right? Just just a straight shot, basically. Right. All right. It's basically the same thing. It just goes east to west, straight through the city, and it is on, somewhere along that road is where uh, Saul is waiting for the Lord to send somebody to help him. He doesn't know that Ananias is coming, but God is now talking to Ananias, saying, "Go and do what they do." Mm -hmm. And so again, we have the depiction of somebody not really knowing what their the outcome is going to be, but being obedient. Right. So obedience is very prevalent in this, okay? Which is exactly what we're supposed to do: is be obedient. Uh, I know we're in the Book of Romans, where it says Paul says, "And Jesus was obedient all the way to death on the cross." Mm -hmm. All right, so. If we go back all the way back to Genesis 1, we'll see that the, uh, the sin that caused all sin to come into the world is the sin of disobedience. And so that's why obedience is prevalent throughout the Bible. Here's a good rendition of it, and we've already seen one with Saul. He tells Ananias, even though you're scared, even though you know this guy, even though you know that he's trying to kill people, arrest people, etc., etc., do what I tell you to do. And Ananias says this, you sure? <laughs> no, he didn't say that. <laughs> okay. Read 12, please. And in a vision, he has seen a, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Now, he doesn't know who Ananias is. He doesn't know him from uh, Adam. John, Adam. <laughs> Adam. I was going to say John, Paul, Ringo, or, or George. <laughs> and he doesn't. He doesn't know who he is. Uh, but he knows in a vision, now this is a mental vision, not a not something he actually sees with his eyes, because his eyes are blinded. In this mental vision, in this mental state that he is in, he knows that the Lord is going to send somebody by the name of Ananias, because God has given him the name, he is going to send him to uh, to him to uh, to uh, help him out. Okay? Not knowing again what the guy's going to do. I mean, for all he knows, maybe the guy's going to come and whack his head off, you know, or arrest him. We don't know. Or he doesn't know. But he's trusting in the Lord. So, uh, 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. There you go. He, he has heard about Paul, Saul, uh, persecuting the Israelites uh, over in Israel. Uh, he's gotten the... Um, the, uh, the petitions or the letters of arrest, if you will, from the high priest over in Israel. And he's going around all of uh, Jerusalem and, and Israel, uh, you know, arresting people and throwing them in jail and, you know, persecuting them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the word spread real, real quickly that this guy's not a good guy. He's not a good guy at all. And so uh, Ananias is saying, are you sure about this? I mean, come on. Uh, but actually what Ananias is saying, they're saying, I've heard about this guy, Lord. I'm scared, but you tell me to do it, and so therefore I go. Right. So uh, Ezekiel, is it Ezekiel? Oh, I'm drawing a blank now. I th no, I think it was uh, Isaiah. He's, <coughs> no, it's Ezekiel. He says, here I am, Lord, send me. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that, that's what we're supposed to, that's the attitude we're supposed to have. If God directs us somewhere to go or something to do, uh, I'll put it this way. If God tells us to start praying in front of other people and we think we can't do it, then we just step out and do it anyway. Right, Margo? <laughs> right? Exactly. Because we know God's going to take care of it. We don't have to worry about it. God's going to take care of it. So we do what he tells us to do. We be obedient. All right? All right. Uh, verse 14. Yes. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Anybody who believes in Jesus Christ, that's who he's persecuting. That's who he's after. That's who he's trying to get rid of. Anybody who believes in this thing called the way, this new thing called Christianity, anybody, that's who he is after because he is trying to do the work of God by getting rid of the Christians, right? Okay, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So, right there, it tells us that, that 
Saul is appointed by Christ to be a major figure here. A major figure. Because not, is he, not only is he going to teach the children of Israel, because he is a Pharisee of Pharisees, remember? I mean, he's, he was taught by Gamaliel, came up through the, uh, the temple and all that stuff. He knows, I mean, he's, Gamaliel was the master teacher, if you will, if you remember that. And so he, uh, Saul is like a master teacher. I mean, he's very high up. But not only is he going to teach the children of Israel, but he's also going to teach the Gentiles. The Gentiles, well, that's got to be the people that he's trying to get rid of. Okay? The ones who are now the part of the believers. But then it also says that he's going to teach kings. And of course, if we get, whenever we get back over into uh, uh, 20, 24, 25, 26, I think it is, uh, one in particular, uh, I think his name was Agrippa. Uh, Paul goes to him, uh, you know, because Paul's going through, he's going to be taken before many kings and tried. And I'm pretty sure it's Agrippa. Anyway, Paul goes before him and Agrippa says, hey, 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 you know, I believe all this stuff you do, but are you trying to make me a Christian? You, you want me to be one of them people? No, I don't think so, you know. But Paul was a minister to the kings as well. Because there'd be other kings. Well, remember he he wanted to uh, uh, after I can't think of their names. He wanted, and we'll see him in the book of Acts later on. We'll see at his different trials that he goes to. He eventually says, "No, I want to go before the emperor. I want to go before the emperor Caesar. That's who I want to judge me." And so, right here, he's telling us how mighty of a man of God that Paul's going to be. Saul is now. And he's going to be when he becomes Paul because he's going to be an apostle to not only to the Jew but also to the Gentile and also to kings, to the royalty. And of course, if we look through the New Testament, he wrote more than half of the New Testament. If you count, and I do believe he wrote the book of Hebrews, if you count Hebrews, then he wrote set, um, 14, uh, 14 of the 27 books. That's right, yeah, 27 books. Four, there's 66 in the Bible. I don't no, no, it's 27 in the uh, in the New Testament. Okay. And he wrote 14 of the 27 of the 27 books. Wow. If you count Hebrews, okay, and I truly believe he wrote Hebrews, and so do many others. Mm -hmm. Although it's never mentioned in Hebrews actually who the author is. All right, so we're finding out that God is telling Ananias to go to this guy. Because he is God's, again, chosen by Christ, right? Yes. So that's the only way you can be an apostle. That's one of the criteria of being an apostle. You have to be chosen by Christ. And that's not something, oh yeah, God came to me in a vision and told me I'm his apostle now, and so now I'm an apostle. <laughs> well, you weren't there 2,000 years ago. Okay, yeah. That's another thing you got to be. Um, so, um, verse or he, he said, he is saying here in 15 that, uh, that he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel. And then, here comes the stumper. <coughs> Go to 16, read 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now wait a minute. If I'm Paul, or Saul, okay, you didn't say how many rewards I'm going to get. You didn't say how many crowns I'm going to get. You didn't say how happy I'm going to be. You didn't say how many blessings I'm going to get. All you said was is how much suffering I'm going to have to do. I don't know if I want this gig. <laughs> you know, I don't want to. I'm not sure that I uh, really want to do this here, Lord. <clears throat> but but what does that tell us? It tells us that if God calls us to service to Him, that a just like he tells us over in the Sermon on the Mount in uh, chapter uh, 6, either 6 or 7, mm -hmm. he says, don't worry about tomorrow's troubles because tomorrow will have troubles of its own. You just worry about today's. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're going to have troubles every day. So you're going to have stuff to deal with every day. Especially being a Christian, you're going to have things to worry about and things to suffer because people are going to persecute you. Mm -hmm. People are not going to agree with you. People are going to say, oh, you're one of them. No, 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 no. And uh, so we have to realize that as Christ suffered, we will never have to suffer as much as he did. Right. We're not going to go to be uh, put on a cross. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, now, if you go over into that part of the world, uh, it, there's a good possibility that could happen. Uh, but we're not going to be put on a naked on a stake uh, and uh, a pointed stake, and then put a pitch put on us, and then set a <laughs> fire so we can light the path down the road. You know, that's not going to happen to us, most likely. You know, but those kind of things are still happening today. People are dying for the cause. For Christ every day over in those areas mm -hmm. um, I mean it's just it's going on so don't think that it can't happen but most likely <laughs> we will never suffer anything near what a lot of other people have if we just call one of them old crazy Christians then so be it what's wrong with that all right I want to be crazy for the Lord yeah. all right? but he tells Paul he says these are the things you're going to suffer for my sake so we have to take that, or we should take that, is that there's going to be problems that we're going to have to suffer for his sake. But are we going to stay true? Or are we going to say, oh, I didn't sign up for that. Okay? Well, believe me, when you sign up for it, you sign up for the whole thing, the whole enchilada. Okay? And it's going to come. Don't think it's not. You're going to have friends that don't want to be your friend anymore. You're going to have friends who say they're your friend, and then they're going to stab you in the back. You're going to have people who will uh, come against your wife, against your husband. Um, it's, just, it's going to be. Okay? It's going to be. Why? Because people are scared of the truth. <coughs> they're scared of the truth. And when you bring the truth to them, which you're doing it in love, you're not doing it in hate. But when you bring the truth to them, just like the scripture says, they don't want to know the truth because it shows light or shines light on their sins. Okay? Kind of like I said Sunday, you know, if you want to know about the sexual immoral uh, laws that God has established, go to Leviticus 18 through 22, primarily 18 through 21, and you can read about the sexually immoral laws and statutes that God established, and they're still true today. Um, people don't want to hear that stuff. They want to hear, oh, well, our government says that we can kill babies if we want to. Well, there was a, uh, a religion our God called Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H, called Molech, that people sacrificed their babies to back in Jesus' time. I mean, they would, they would heat the statue of Molech up, and his hands would be out like this, and it would be made of bronze and iron and all that, and the hands would be red hot, and they would take their live babies and put them in the hands of this God and fry their babies in front of them and kill them. Okay? Um, Talk about suffering. I mean, you know, this is an innocent baby that's going through this kind of stuff. You're going to have people who are going to uh, come against you in all shapes, forms, and fashions that you would have never thought they would. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to happen. But what do you do? You just take it in stride mm -hmm. and say, okay, well, God's going to bless me in return somehow, some way. I mean, that's all you can do, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can't do much more. You yeah. can't uh, beat them a sandwich, right? <laughs> you can't do that kind of stuff. You got to, uh, you got to just kind of take it on the chin sometimes and uh, let it go. And keep the faith. Keep the faith. Believe that God's going to take care of it because exactly. He's the one. He is our our uh, uh, our uh, leader. He is our counselor. He is our instructor. He is our protector. I mean, on and on and on and on. We have to trust in Him. Mm -hmm. what, what does He say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right? Yes. Not, not ours, His. It's his, yes. Yeah. So we have to trust in Him. So, when God tells you to do something, and what we've learned through here is, is when God tells you to do something, as long as it lines up with His will, the Word, and glorifies Him, we're to do it. Even if we don't know where, when, what, how, and when, uh, who, we still do it. We follow whatever God directs us to do. But first you gotta know that it is of God, all right? Not of Satan, because Satan's a deceiver, and he will, one of those three items will be missing if it's from Satan, always. Right. Because Satan is not God, okay? And he cannot do the same great deeds of God, so he can't imitate God to the fullest. He can only imitate him somewhat, and so that's what he does, all right? All right, all right verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house 
and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now see, as yet, Saul, who becomes Paul, has not received the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we're going to talk about this Sunday. The Holy Spirit, and I talked about it a little bit this last Sunday, the Holy Spirit is power. It's the power of God. Okay? The Holy Spirit is not a thing, though. It is not just a thing that is power. It is a person, the third person of the Trinity, that is the power of God. Okay? It is, well, I'm going to get into Sunday still, but uh, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is the power. So, the power of God is coming into uh, Saul, who is becoming Paul. He's gaining his sight back, and he is going to be able to simply touch people and heal them as an apostle. He's going to have the power of the apostle. Uh, if you remember, we'll see this later on in, uh, I think it's like chapter 18 or 19, where a snake bites Paul on the hand, and he just flips it off into the fire, and no, no effect whatsoever. Why? Because he has the power of God living in him. Okay? Now, we can have the Holy Spirit living in us, but, but Christ is the last apostle, okay? So, therefore, we do not have the power of the apostles today. That was for then. We, we talked about that. It's over at the end of Mark, uh, in uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, where it talks about that you'll hold up serpents, you'll drink poison and all this kind of stuff. But people believe that they can do that. Don't do that. Okay? Okay? You'll die. All right? Don't do that. You don't have those powers. Those powers are the apostolic, apostolic powers. And the apostles have that power. After that, after the apostles, after Paul, okay, so he's the last one on earth, then we rely on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to do those things. Not another person, because we know the, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the triune God. Okay? So it is, he is God. So if we rely on a man to do those things, then why do we need the Holy Spirit? Okay? So the, there is no apostle that has that power anymore. It is only the power of the, of the Holy Spirit that does. Mm -hmm. All right? So, I like it here where Ananias calls, calls him Brother Saul. <laughs> okay? Now, why would he do that? Why do you think he would call him brother? Because he, he became a Christian. So now he's a brother. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he, hadn't, he hasn't received the Holy Spirit yet. Oh. He received the Holy Spirit at the end. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, right? See that? Yeah. Who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, he knows, Ananias knows, that Saul was sent by Christ. And then also Ananias knows that he was sent by Christ. Well, Christ doesn't send anybody unless Christ has claimed that person. It's like some people will say, um, oh yeah, the Holy Spirit speaks to me, uh, but yeah, I'm not a believer in Jesus Christ. That can't happen. No. Okay. Uh, I don't really believe in God, but I think the, the Spirit spoke to me last night. <laughs> it's an evil spirit that speaks to you. Okay. Yeah. Because Scripture tells us, uh, I mean, the book of Romans is such a great, great book, and I know I've been teaching a lot out of it on Sundays, but the book of Romans, uh, I think it's in chapter 9, it says, uh, uh, not only can you not, no, no, that's in a different chapter, that's in 6, I think, but it talks about um, if you do not have Jesus, you do not have God. Well, if you do not have Jesus and you do not have God, because you can't have one without the other, you have to have them both, then you also can't have the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, you, if Saul has Christ and Ananias has Christ, then they also have God. And so, therefore, Ananias knows right off the bat, well, if God sent him and God sent him me, then he's, he's in us both. We're brothers. 
with brothers and sisters. And this is another thing that as we as Christians, we get met, we get church has taught us wrong, if you will. First and foremost, the Bible was written to believers, not written to unbelievers. Okay? These blessings that are in the book, the teachings that are in the book, on and on and on, they're not for non believers. They're for people who believe. Because there's no benefit to this to people who don't believe in it. It's just letters on a page. <clears throat> Those who are not our brothers and sisters in Christ, okay, we don't have the same relationship with them that we have with non-believers. Okay, we have a different relationship. Okay, we're not put on this earth to have the brother relation, sister relationship with non-believers as we are to have with believers. I'm to treat you differently than I treat somebody that is not a non-believer, an atheist, let's say. Right. Okay? Because they're not my brother or sister. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, if they become our brothers and sisters, and that is who we are to go out to reach, that's who that's our mission field, is those who are non-believers. Right. All right? Um, our mission field is not us. We're already saved. We're already brothers and sisters. Our mission field are the people outside of the church, if you will. All right? And we're to go out to them to try to, in a sense, bring them to Christ so that He can change them, but they are not our brothers and sisters. So when the world says, oh, well, you got to love me because you're a Christian, but I don't believe any of that crap. Okay? No, no. We don't have to love them. I don't believe that part either. We, we, don't, have to love, we don't have to love We don't have to treat them the way that, that we treat our brothers and sisters. Right. Now, we do it because Christ leaves us with the second command, which is to love your neighbor as you would have Christ love you. So we do it in hopes to try to bring them into the into Christ. All right, but we are not obligated to them to treat them the way that we treat brothers and sisters. Do we understand that? Because that's very important. Because the world will come at you. Oh, well, you got to do this for me because you're a Christian. Oh, well, you got to do what I want because you're a Christian. No, you don't. You don't. You, you owe that person nothing because they're not your brothers and sisters. Now, do you want to love them to hopefully that they will be your brothers and sisters? By all means. By all means, that's what you want to do. But if they, I mean, go back to the scripture where Jesus says, come into a house and, and uh, bring your blessings to the house. And if it is not welcome, kick the dust off your feet and go to the next one. Okay? If you go to somebody on the outside of the church, if you will, and outside of our brother and sisterhood, if you go to somebody and they don't accept you, see ya. You know, Jack's prayer. Maybe somebody can get to you. But, you know, I don't need to waste my time with you. You know? Now, you want to, if you can, maybe you can convince it. I don't want to say convince because that's the wrong word. But maybe you can, can show them that there is a better way of living your life you live it for Christ instead of for yourself. But if they refuse, you don't know nothing. Don't feel obligated. Don't feel obligated at all. Again, you still want to love them if you can. But if they refuse, kick the dust off your feet and move on to the next one. Maybe somebody else can save them. Or, you know what I mean. All right? And see, but the world doesn't think that. The world says, oh, well, you're a Christian, so you got to do what I want. You gotta give me what I want. You gotta be good to me. You gotta love me. I don't gotta love you. Matter of fact, I don't even like you. <laughs> you know? We have to love them from afar. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Alright. So the Holy Spirit comes and fills him, and so now he is a brother. Right? Right. Alright. None of us are brothers and sisters until we are, and this is gonna be in this week's, maybe the next couple of weeks' teachings. Nobody's a Christian. There is no such thing as a born-again Christian. Do you know that? Right. There's no such thing as a born-again Christian. If you're born again, you are a Christian. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you're not born again, you're not a Christian. There's no such thing as a born-again Christian. You're either a Christian, and if you are, then you're born again. Mm -hmm. And you're not a Christian until you are born again. Do, do, you do we get that? Right. Okay? Yeah. It, it's kind of a... Not an oxymoron, but it's kind of a, a useless term. Yeah, because it's not like repetition. That part didn't need to be in there. 
Yeah, yeah you either are or you're not. Yeah, you either are or you're not. Yeah. If if you're a Christian, Jesus said it in uh, John three when he talked to Nicodemus. He says, "Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God." That was in verse five. Verse seven says, "You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again." Right. So if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. That's right. But if you are born again, you are a Christian. But there's no such thing as a born again Christian. Okay? Because it makes no sense. Yes. It doesn't. I mean, if you really think about it. Now, you can say it, and that's okay. And people say it all the time. Because the church has taught people to say that. Yeah. Okay? But in all actuality, it's... What did you say? It's just repetition. Yeah, it's a repetition of the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're born, uh, born again, you are a Christian. Yeah. And if you are a Christian, you have been born again. You cannot have one without the other. Right. All right? So there's no born again Christian. I'm a Christian, but I'm not born again. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You can't be. And we're going to talk about that kind of in depth uh, this coming, uh, I don't know if it's going to be this week or next week. But it's all part of the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, I mean, it's just, it's a good teaching, I think. Or it's getting better as I study through it. Okay. Uh, where are we at? 18? 18. All right. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. There you go. Now he was baptized already in the Holy Spirit because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Right. All right. So that's, that's when he got baptized. But now, because we do a water baptism the way Jesus tells us to in remembrance of him, we do two things in remembrance of Christ. We do the water baptism and we do the Lord's Supper, right? right? And so now he is being baptized in the water. Not that he's shown anybody, because theoretically we only see that it's uh, uh, Ananias and, and Paul there, okay? So, who's now Paul. So, he's not doing a public proclamation to anyone else, but he's doing it because Jesus tells us to do it in remembrance of him, okay? So, he has received the Holy Spirit which is the true baptism. And then he is baptized in the water to, in essence, to do the John's baptism, which is the, repent the water baptism for the repentance of sin. Mm -hmm. So he's changing his ways. He's getting rid of that sin of being the recluse and the persecutor of the Christians. He's getting rid of that sin, washing it away, symbolism, okay? Mm -hmm. And going to become this new Christian that Christ has called him to be. Mm -hmm. All right? Verse 19. So when, he had so when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent days, some days, with the disciples at Damascus. Okay, he spent some time with the disciples in Damascus because, it's, uh, and if you read over in the first part of Gal Galatians chapter 1, you will see that uh, it goes all through that, that he spent some time with the disciples, then he spent time with Jesus, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, it's over in Galatians chapter 1. But what he's doing is, is he's, he's now an apostle. Okay? So what does an apostle do? Okay? Well, he don't really know what an apostle does. Okay? He doesn't really know. He's, and now he's a disciple. So what does a disciple do? Well, he doesn't have any idea. He's going to go to the city and wait to be told what to do. Well, that's, that's where he's at right now. Yeah. That's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. He's going to the cities, and now he's going to start mingling with Ananias and maybe other disciples there in, uh, in uh, Damascus so mm -hmm. that he can learn what a disciple is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Learn what an apostle is because he doesn't know. He hasn't, he hasn't done it. Right. This is all new to him. Mm -hmm. Okay? How many times, you know, or not how many times, but I'm sure at some important time, whenever you first became a Christian, if you will, uh, you said, okay, now what? What? now what? Now what? What do I do now? You know, and, and that's where we generally lead people. We lead people, oh yeah, you got to get baptized, so let's dunk you in the water, which has nothing to do with your true baptism. Let's dunk you in the water, okay, now you're baptized. And, okay, we'll see you next week, I hope. And the person says, so what am I supposed to do now? And that's what we fail as a church. What we're supposed to do is, and not just as the church, but also that person who is the new Christian, they fail because they don't come to 
Bible studies. They don't come to next Sunday service. They don't come, they don't get their Bible out and start reading it on their own. They don't start praying on their own. They just simply say, okay, I got baptized, I'm saved, now I'm going to go live like hell. I'm going to go live like I used to and go do the things. But all I need to do is get that, water, get that dunked in that water. That way I can get to heaven, get my ticket punched. And that's not what it's about. It's not what it's about at all. So we have to realize that whenever someone is baptized, and all you can do is welcome them, okay? All you can do is ask them. When we baptize someone, which we have, well, I can't go there. I'm, I'm worried about one person. Uh, but when we invite that person and we instruct that person, that person still has to do their part, okay? They have to, if they really want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit by welcoming God into them, which is the true baptism, if they're really wanting that, when that happens, there has to be that change. There has to be that new creation. And that person should have the desire to seek the Lord out more. Mm -hmm. Well, if you come in here and you get dunked in the water and you never come back, that's on you, you know? And most likely, I'm just saying, and it's between them and God, most likely that person is not baptized. Why? Because they tried to go through the motions, the physical motions, instead of the spiritual rebirth. Right. And the spiritual rebirth is what we need. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus says, you must be born of the water and born of the Spirit. And you must be born again. Mm -hmm. And if you're not born again, then you're just going to go out and do the same thing that you did last week and the week before. You're going to live the same old life you've always lived. You're not going to seek out God. I went and got baptized. Matter of fact, I got baptized in the last 15 churches I've been in. So I'm baptized. Well, that's not true. It's not true at all. Because you're not baptized in the Spirit. Because the water does nothing but get you wet. That's all it does. Okay? And all right. it's pretty cold. Oh, I try to keep it going. That way it wake people up. Wake them up. All right, so we're going to pick it up in verse 20, right? That's right. All right. We didn't get very far. Well, we got, we got far enough. I think it was good stuff. It was. I think there's been a time or two we've only done one or two verses. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> so we got quite a few of them done. We did. <coughs> 19, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway, Paul, uh, or Saul... Start preaching next week. So we'll pick that up. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, oh, uh, my guy's not here tonight to press out. So uh, somebody else going to have to step up tonight. Uh, any volunteers? Oh, yeah, not everybody at the same time now. Come on. I'll do it. <laughs> you want to do it? All right. Press out, baby. Dear Lord, thank you for this Bible study and for all of us that are here and the ones that are watching online. We just ask that you give us all peace and comfort and watch over everyone on on the prayer list. Amen. Heal them if they need healing and just give them blessings, Lord, and also the names in our prayer book, Lord. And you, you know everything. You know what's going on with each and every person. Lord, I ask... Um, Again, just to make sure um, I get to Oregon okay. Amen. Travel mercies and Amen. watch over Rock and Country Church as I go and Amen. and just uh, help our community, Lord. Just bless everyone and our military, first responders, and our homeless, and just everyone, Lord. We thank you for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all for being with us tonight on the uh, video. God bless you. Have a great week. I uh, hope to see you Sunday. Those of you who are sick, get well soon. We'll see you then. Amen. God bless you.